Good day everyone. So welcome to our discussion in the subject CS211 for programming languages. So by the way, I am Sir Exodelio Lasso and our lesson for today is all about syntax and semantics of programming languages. So the study of programming languages is like the study of natural languages can be divided into examinations of syntax and semantics. So the syntax of programming language is the form of its expressions, statements, and program units. And its semantics is the meaning of those expressions, statements, and program units. Lesson 3. Describing Syntax and Semantics Topics Introduction The general problem of a describing syntax Formal methods of describing syntax Attribute grammars Describing semantics Learning objective At the end of the lesson, students should be able to Define the meaning of syntax and semantics and Identify the difference between syntax and semantics Before we discuss the general problem of the language description We need to understand what is language description is What is meant for Why do we even need to care about it why do we need to discuss this topic? Now imagine, you as a programmer of a language, you don't know how a statement is composed or why it is composed this way. If you don't know this elementary part, how can you code? Or let's say for a certain reason, you need to know which one come first, which token, or which a part of the statement that you are typing in programming language. Why we type this one before the other one, for example, you are creating a for loop. Why do we put for at the beginning before it branches in Java, let's say, or any other programming languages C or C++, so why do not we put for, for example, at the end or very end and for that reason. There are some rule and we need to learn in the beginning. So we need to understand the description of the language, or proper description. And now we recategorize this description in details after a while. One of the problems in describing a language is the diversity of the people who must understand the description. Among these are initial evaluators, implementers, and users. Most new programming languages are subjected to a period of scrutiny by potential users. Often people within the organization that employs the language's designer. Before their designs are completed, these are the initial evaluators. The success of this feedback cycle depends heavily on the clarity of the description. Programming language implementers obviously must be able to Determine how the expressions, statements, and program units of a language are formed. And also their intended effect when executed. The difficulty of the implementer's job is, in part, determined by the completeness and precision of the language description. Language users must be able to determine how to encode software solutions by referring to a language reference manual. Textbooks and courses enter into this process. But language manuals are usually the only authoritative printed information source about a language. The study of programming languages, like the study of natural languages, can be divided into examinations of syntax and semantics. The syntax of a programming language is the form of its expressions, statements, and program units. Its semantics is the meaning of those expressions, statements, and program units. For example, the syntax of a Java while statement is while, boolean underscore expr, statement. The semantics of this statement form is that when the current value of the boolean expression is true, the embedded statement is executed. Then control implicitly returns to the Boolean expression to repeat the process. If the Boolean expression is false, control transfers to the statement following. Describing syntax is easier than describing semantics. 
partly because a concise and universally accepted notation is available for syntax description, but none has yet been developed for semantics. Formal descriptions of the syntax of programming languages, for simplicity's sake, often do not include descriptions of the lowest level syntactic units. These small units are called lexemes. The description of lexemes can be given by a lexical specification, which is usually separate from the syntactic description of the language. The lexemes of a programming language include its numeric literals, operators, and special words, among others. One can think of programs as strings of lexemes rather than of characters. Lexemes are partitioned into groups. For example, the names of variables, methods, classes, and so forth in a programming language form a group called identifiers. Each lexeme group is represented by a name or token. For example, the token for the arithmetic operator symbol plus has just one possible lexeme. Consider the following Java statement index equals to asterisk count plus 17. The lexemes and tokens of this statement are, in general, languages can be formally defined into distinct ways, by recognition and by generation. Although neither provides a definition that is practical by itself for people trying to learn or use a programming language. Suppose we have a language L that uses an alphabet sum of characters. To define L formally using the recognition method, we would need to construct a mechanism R, called a recognition device, capable of reading strings of characters from the alphabet sum. R would indicate whether a given input string was or was not in L. In effect, R would either accept or reject the given string. Such devices are like filters. Separating legal sentences from those that are incorrectly formed, if R. When fed any string of characters over some, accepts it only if it is in L. Then R is a description of L. Because most useful languages are. For all practical purposes, infinite, this might seem like a lengthy and ineffective process. Recognition devices, however, are not used to enumerate all of the senses of a language they have a different purpose. A language generator is a device that can be used to generate the senses of a language. We can think of the generator as having a button that produces a sentence of the language every time it is pushed. Because the particular sentence that is produced by a generator when its button is pushed is unpredictable. A generator seems to be a device of limited usefulness as a language descriptor. However, people prefer certain forms of generators over recognizers because they can more easily read and understand them. By contrast, the syntax checking portion of a compiler a language recognizer is not as useful a language description for a programmer because it can be used only in trial and error mode. For example, to determine the correct syntax of a particular statement using a compiler, the programmer can only submit a speculated version and note whether the compiler accepts it. On the other hand, it is often possible to determine whether the syntax of a particular statement is correct by comparing it with the structure of the generator. This section discusses the formal language generation mechanisms, usually called grammars, that are commonly used to describe the syntax of programming languages. In the middle to late 1950s, two men, Noam Chomsky and John Backus, in unrelated research efforts, developed the same syntax description formalism. 
which subsequently became the most widely used method for programming language syntax. In the mid-1950s, Noam Chomsky, a noted linguist among other things, described for classes of generative devices or grammars that define for classes of languages. Chomsky, 1956-1959 Two of these grammar classes, named context-free and regular, turned out to be useful for describing the syntax of programming languages. The forms of the tokens of programming languages can be described by regular grammars. The syntax of whole programming languages, with minor exceptions, can be described by context-free grammars, because Chomsky was a linguist. His primary interest was the theoretical nature of natural languages. He had no interest at the time in the artificial languages used to communicate with computers. So it was not until later that his work was applied to programming languages. Shortly after Chomsky's work on language classes, the ACM GAM group began designing ALGOL 58. A landmark paper describing ALGOL 58 was presented by John Backus, a prominent member of the ACM GAM group, at an international conference in 1959, Bacchus, 1959. This paper introduced a new formal notation for specifying programming language syntax. The new notation was later modified slightly by Peter Knorr for the description of ALGOL 60 Knorr, 1960. This revised method of syntax description became known as Bacchus Knorr form or simply BNF. BNF is a natural notation for describing syntax. In fact, something similar to BNF was used by Panini to describe the syntax of Sanskrit. Several hundred years before Christ, Ingerman, 1967. Although the use of BNF in the Algol 60 report was not immediately accepted by computer users, it soon became and is still the most popular method of concisely describing programming language. Syntax A meta-language is a language that is used to describe another language. BNF is a meta-language for programming languages. BNF uses abstractions for syntactic structures, a simple Java assignment statement. For example, might be represented by the abstraction, pointed brackets are often used to delimit names of abstractions. A sign gives var equals expression. The actual definition of can be given by a sign. Gives var equals expression, the text on the left side of the arrow, which is aptly called the left-hand side LHS, is the abstraction being defined. The text to the right of the arrow is the definition of the LHS. It is called the right-hand side RHS and consists of some mixture of tokens, lexemes, and references to other abstractions. Actually, tokens are also abstractions. Altogether, the definition is called a rule or production. In the example rule just given, the abstractions and obviously must be defined for the definition to be useful. This particular rule specifies that the abstraction is defined as an instance of the abstraction, followed by the lexeme equals, followed by an instance of the abstraction. Variable length lists in mathematics are often written using an ellipsis. 1, 2 is an example. BNF does not include the ellipsis, so an alternative method is required for describing lists of syntactic elements in programming languages. For example, a list of identifiers appearing on a data declaration statement for BNF. The alternative is recursion, 
A rule is recursive if its LHS appears in its RHS. Ident underscore list greater than gives identifier. Identifier, ident underscore list. This defines as either a single token identifier or an identifier followed by a comma and another instance of. Recursion is used to describe lists in many of the example grammars. In the remainder of this chapter, a grammar is a generative device for defining languages. The senses of the language are generated through a sequence of applications of the rules. Beginning with a special non-terminal of the grammar called the start symbol. In a grammar for a complete programming language, the start symbol represents a complete program and is often named program. This sequence of rule applications is called a derivation. In a grammar for a complete programming language, the start symbol represents a complete program and is often named. The simple grammar shown in example 3.1 is used to illustrate derivations. The language described by the grammar of example 3.1 has only one statement form, assignment. Take a look at it. A program consists of the special word begin, followed by a list of statements separated by semicolons, followed by the special word end. An expression is either a single variable or two variables separated by either a plus or operator. The only variable names in this language are a, b, and c. This derivation like all derivations, begins with the start symbol. In this case, the symbol equals greater than is read derives. Each successive string in the sequence is derived from the previous string. By replacing one of the non-terminals with one of that non-terminal's definitions, each of the strings in the derivation, including, is called a sentential form in this derivation. The replaced non-terminal is always the leftmost non-terminal in the previous sentential form. Derivations that use this order of replacement are called leftmost derivations. The derivation continues until the sentential form contains no non-terminals, that sentential form, consisting of only terminals or lexemes, is the generated sentence. In addition to leftmost, a derivation may be rightmost or in an order that is neither leftmost nor rightmost. Derivation order has no effect on the language generated by a grammar. One of the most attractive features of grammars is that they naturally describe the hierarchical syntactic structure of the senses of the languages they define. Take a look at the illustration. These hierarchical structures are called parse trees. For example, the parse tree in figure 3.1 shows the structure of the assignment statement derived previously. Ambiguity in grammars. Ambiguity, the quality of being open to more than one interpretation. A grammar is ambiguous if and only if it generates a sentential form that has two or more distinct parse trees. Consider the grammar shown in example 3.3, which is a minor variation of the grammar shown in example 3.2. The grammar of example 3.3 is ambiguous because the sentence A equals B plus C asteriska has to distinct parse trees. The ambiguity occurs 
because the grammar specifies slightly less syntactic structure than does the grammar of example 3.2. Rather than allowing the parse tree of an expression to grow only on the right, this grammar allows growth on both the left and the right. An unambiguous expression grammar. The BNF rules for a Java if else statement are as follows. If underscore STMT greater than gives, if logic underscore EXPR STMT greater than, if logic underscore EXPR STMT greater than else, STMT greater than, if we also have STMT gives if underscore stnt, this grammar is ambiguous. The simplest sentential form that illustrates this ambiguity is if logic underscore expr, if logic underscore expr, stmt greater than else, stmt. The two parse trees in figure 3.3 show the ambiguity. Of this sentential form, consider the following example of this construct. The problem is that if the left parse tree in figure 3.3 is used as the basis for translation, the else clause would be executed when done is not true, which probably is not what was intended by the author of the construct. Grammars and recognizers. Earlier this chapter, we suggested that there is a close relationship between generation and recognition devices for a given language. In fact, given a context-free grammar, a recognizer for the language generated by the grammar can be algorithmically constructed. One of the first of these syntax analyzer generators is named Yak. Yet another compiler compiler, Johnson, 1975. There are now many such systems available. Attribute grammars. An attribute grammar is a device used to describe more of the structure of a programming language than can be described with a context-free grammar. An attribute grammar is an extension to a context-free grammar. The extension allows certain language rules to be conveniently described, such as type compatibility. Before we formally define the form of attribute grammars, we must clarify the concept of static semantics. History of attribute grammars. Attribute grammars have been used in a wide variety of applications. They have been used to provide complete descriptions of the syntax and static semantics of programming languages what? 1979. They have been used as the formal definition of a language that can be input to a compiler generation system, Faro, 1982. And they have been used as the basis of several syntax-directed editing systems, Teitelbaum and Reps, 1981, Fisher et al., 1984. In addition, attribute grammars have been used in natural language processing systems, Corea. 1992. Static semantics and dynamic semantics. As an example of a syntax rule that cannot be specified in BNF, consider the common rule that all variables must be declared before they are referenced. It has been proven that this rule cannot be specified in BNF. These problems exemplify the categories of language rules called static semantics rules. The static semantics of a language is only indirectly related to the meaning of programs during execution, rather. It has to do with the legal forms of program syntax rather than semantics. While dynamic semantics, which is the meaning of expressions, statements, and program units, Describing the meanings of programs, dynamic semantics. We now turn to the difficult task of describing the dynamic semantics, or meaning, of the expressions, statements, 
and program units of a programming language. Because of the power and naturalness of the available notation, describing syntax is a relatively simple matter. On the other hand, no universally accepted notation or approach has been devised for dynamic semantics. There are several different reasons underlying the need for a methodology and notation for describing semantics. Programmers obviously need to know precisely what the statements of a language do before they can use them effectively in their programs. Compiler writers must know exactly what language constructs mean to design implementations for them correctly. If there were a precise semantic specification of a programming language, programs written in the language potentially could be proven correct without testing. Also, compilers could be shown to produce programs that exhibited exactly the behavior given in the language definition, that is, their correctness could be verified. A complete specification of the syntax and semantics of a programming language could be used by a tool to generate a compiler for the language automatically. Finally, language designers who would develop the semantic descriptions of their languages could in the process discover ambiguities and inconsistencies in their designs. Scheme a functional language is one of only a few programming languages whose definition includes a formal semantics description. Default text. The idea behind operational semantics is to describe the meaning of a statement or program by specifying the effects of running it on a machine. The effects on the machine are viewed as the sequence of changes in its state, where the machine's state is the collection of the values in its storage. There are several problems with using this approach. The individual steps in the execution of machine language and the resulting changes to the state of the machine are too small and too numerous, and the storage of a real computer is too large and complex. There are different levels of uses of operational semantics. At the highest level, the interest is in the final result of the execution of a complete program. This is sometimes called natural operational semantics. At the lowest level, Operational semantics can be used to determine the precise meaning of a program through an examination of the complete sequence of state changes that occur when the program is executed. This use is sometimes called structural operational semantics. For example, the semantics of the C4 construct can be described in terms of simpler statements, as in The human reader of such a description is the virtual computer and is assumed to be able to execute the instructions in the definition correctly and recognize the effects of the execution. Denotational semantics. Denotational semantics is the most rigorous and most widely known formal method for describing the meaning of programs. It is solidly based on recursive function theory the process of constructing a denotational semantic specification for a programming language requires one to define for each language entity both a mathematical object and a function that maps instances of that language entity onto instances of the mathematical object.
Denotational semantics versus operational semantics. Denotational semantics is related to operational semantics. In operational semantics, programming language constructs are translated into simpler programming language constructs, which become the basis of the meaning of the construct. In denotational semantics, Programming language constructs are mapped to mathematical objects, either sets or, more often, functions. However, unlike operational semantics, denotational semantics does not model the step-by-step -step computational processing of programs. Axiomatic semantics Axiomatic semantics, thus named because it is based on mathematical logic, is the most abstract approach to semantic specification, rather than directly specifying the meaning of a program. Axiomatic semantics specifies what can be proven about the program. In axiomatic semantics, there is no model of the state of a machine or program or model of state changes that take place when the program is executed. The meaning of a program is based on relationships among program variables and constants, which are the same for every execution of the program. Axiomatic semantics has two distinct applications. Program verification and program semantic specification. This section focuses on program verification in its description of axiomatic semantics. Axiomatic semantics was defined in conjunction with the development of an approach to proving the correctness of programs, such correctness proofs when they can be constructed, show that a program performs the computation described by its specification. The logical expressions used in axiomatic semantics are called predicates or assertions. An assertion immediately preceding a program statement describes the constraints on the program. Variables at that point in the program. An assertion immediately following a statement describes the new constraints on those variables and possibly others. After execution of the statement, these assertions are called the precondition and postcondition, respectively, of the statement. For two adjacent statements, the postcondition of the first serves as the precondition of the second. Developing an axiomatic description or proof of a given program requires that Every statement in the program has both a precondition and a postcondition. As a simple example, consider the following assignment statement and postcondition. Sum equals to asterisk x plus 1 sum greater than 1. Precondition and post-condition assertions are presented in braces to distinguish them from parts of program. Statements, one possible precondition for this statement is x greater than 10. Weakest preconditions. The weakest precondition is the least restrictive precondition. That will guarantee the validity of the associated postcondition. For example, in the statement and postcondition x greater than 10, x greater than 50, and x greater than 1000 are all valid preconditions. The weakest of all preconditions in this case is x greater than 0. An inference rule is a method of inferring the truth 
of one assertion on the basis of the values of other assertions. The general form of an inference rule is as follows. S1, S2, SNS. This rule states that if S1, S2, and Sn are true, then the truth of S can be inferred. The top part of an inference rule is called its antecedent. The bottom part is called its consequent. An axiom is a logical statement that is assumed to be true. Therefore, an axiom is an inference rule without an antecedent. That is the end of our lesson. Hoping that you learned and understand the syntax and semantics of programming languages. Review questions. Using the grammar, show a parse tree and a leftmost. Derivation for each of the following statements, 1, A equals A asterisk, B plus C asterisk, A 2, B equals C asterisk, asterisk, C plus B 3, A equals A asterisk, B plus C. Using the grammar, show a parse tree and a leftmost. Derivation for each of the following statements. 1. A equals a plus B asterisk C2. A equals B plus C plus A. 3. A equals A asterisk B plus C. Thank you very much for watching.